The following program is brought to you in part by the film Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace. Welcome to another Leon Chani Report, and who do we have with us today? Yuval Steinitz, the chairman of the Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee, the most important committee in the Knesset in the state of Israel, and we are in Tel Aviv interviewing him. And uh, I, we couldn't be here at a more propitious time. The United States is at war in Iraq. Weapons of mass destruction are problems all over the place. Yuval Steinitz conducted a tremendous uh, report on the internal workings of the Mossad and the army and the intelligence forces, and we'll talk to him about that. And on top of uh, everything else, uh, Yuval is a member of the Likud Party, and the Likud Party is pretty well split today between uh, the camp of Bibi Netanyahu and Arik Sharon. And many of you saw our interview last week with uh, Ruby Rivlin, and we went into depth about the possibilities there, and uh, we don't know how that will work out. Obviously, this is being taped before we know the conclusions. Yuval, welcome to the show. Hello, Leon. You're a very bright guy and a man who studies foreign policy and defense, and you're the chairman of a very, very important committee. The Iraqi war, did it affect Israel at all? Yes, the entire region. Uh, it's still too early to know the final consequences, but I think there were two, uh, until now, two major consequences. First, uh, we got rid of Saddam Hussein, and this was quite a relief to the entire region. Uh, Saddam Hussein uh, put direct threat to Israel, but not just to Israel, to Kuwait, to Jordan, to Saudi Arabia, and uh, to his own people. And he also uh, supported Palestinian terrorism, Hamas, Jihad, Fatah, against us, against us by sending money to suicide bombers' families. Right. <clears throat> uh, so it's good to really get rid from such a threat. And another extremely important uh, uh, result, maybe even more important result, was that Libya. Uh, uh, and Libya, <coughs> Libya uh, Gaddafi dismantled uh, his uh, nuclear capacity, his nuclear industry, and they were uh, quite close to achieve uh, nuclear weapons, uh, like the Iranians approximately, maybe even slightly closer. So uh, paradoxically, uh, you fail to dismantle chemical weapon in Iraq, but following the war, you succeeded dismantling much more dangerous and threatening uh, nuclear weapons in uh, the region in Libya. So this is important, and now we have to wait and see what will be uh, next in Iraq and in the entire region. It's too early to say. All right, but the Mossad is a pretty intelligent intelligence operation. You people were scared when that war broke out, let's say, you know, it was normal. You didn't know what kind of nuclear, or if he had nuclear weapons, if he could hit Israel. I mean, the duty of your intelligence people was to check to see whether he had that ability. Mm. Did, what did your people think? That he had that ability or he didn't have that ability? You speak about Saddam Hussein now. Yeah, Saddam we, we Hussein. We shifted the, back to, to Saddam the, Hussein. Right, what the Mossad thought the day before the war, you people, I think, were oh. giving out uh, antidotes and, and even gas masks. Yes. Did you people think that he had weapons of mass no, destruction? No, uh, let me be very clear. We, we, we uh, conducted very thorough investigation, investigation committee and investigation right. uh, to the uh, uh, military intelligence and Mossad uh, right. uh, in uh, following the war in Iraq and also with regard to Libya. 
and uh, it was clear that our intelligence services, both the military intelligence and the Mossad, were uh, quite confident that Saddam Hussein do possess weapons of mass destruction prior to the war. And uh, I think it was two days before the war, they even uh, reported us and the government that they estimate uh, it highly probable that he will attack Israel with such uh, weapons. Uh, we found that this, those were only estimates based on very little, a very dull uh, very, very information. And our criticism of our intelligence services was not so much for the estimates, because we saw the estimates were quite reasonable taking into account Saddam Hussein's past and, 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 uh, and behavior and, and, and things that look, uh, that looks like he got something to hide. But our main criticism was why we had to estimate at first place. We suppose our intelligence services to know and not just to estimate, to bring uh, hard facts, uh, solid information, and concerning Iraq, uh, this was not uh, this was not the case with our intelligence services, and also with uh, American and British intelligence services. Yeah, but it's very interesting that the President of the United States, George Bush, could have reasonably felt that uh, that he got good intelligence from from the British, from the Israelis, from you know. It's a very important point. That's a political point at this point, not yes. not not a defensive. No, point. but what I I uh, do emphasize is that we, due to the reports we got, were pretty sure that Saddam Hussein is hiding uh, weapons of mass destruction chemical weapons. We didn't know about quantities, but we were quite certain about it. Uh, the estimates uh, seems to be very solid. And uh, today we know that we didn't know for sure, and we didn't have enough solid information. It was estimates, very reasonable estimates. What Although they were uh, 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 probably wrong, but very reasonable. Estimates. I'm sure it was. You know, UN Resolution 1441, you're familiar with that, which mm. prohibited that stuff and condemned him because he didn't allow the inspectors to come in. So it's not unreasonable to expect yes. that uh, that was the case. And taking into account his uh, uh, behavior in the past, yes. Right. He was cheating and he even used uh, chemical weapons against his own people. So at the end of the day, before that war, Israel, in a sense, because of the Mossad and your intelligence people, would be prepared for possible uh, weapon, uh, for chemical weapons. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, I can tell you that wow. uh, one or two days before the war, the military intelligence this time reported us that they estimate it as highly probable that Saddam Hussein will attack us with chemical warfare. Uh, so it was quite reasonable to make the necessary preparations. But... Uh, By the way, do you define a weapon of mass destruction as chemical warfare? Look, this is a really good question because actually we are putting all uh, weapons of mass destruction in the same basket. Right. And uh, you have to make clear uh, division or distinction between chemical and even biological warfare, which are extremely dangerous, and nuclear yeah, uh, weapons. Course. This yeah. is a, a different opera. Uh, this is a devastating threat. And therefore, I'm, I'm saying that it was more important to dismantle Libya from its nuclear uh, industry, from its nuclear uh, capacities and ambitions, than to dismantle somebody, even like Saddam Hussein, from chemical uh, weapons. And clearly, Libya would not dismantle itself unless, uh, um, uh, uh, unless Gaddafi uh, saw that America is extremely serious about uh, Saddam Hussein and about uh, preventing weapons of mass destruction. 
We did a two-part series with the uh, founding dean of Harvard uh, Kennedy School, Graham Allison, on um, weapons of mass destruction. <clears throat> and it was our contention with him that unless that is the most serious problem in the world today because it's flexible, you can move it around. And he wrote a book about it now in a way to deter it, which will mm. become, I think, one of the most important books mm. accepted both by George Bush and mm. by uh, uh, Kerry. No matter who becomes mm. the president, I'm sure that he will be involved in that process. Mm. And he's apolitical. And the key to to good intelligence, though, is having people on the ground. And I think what happened, at least in the United States, was they depended too much on technology. And uh, I, I can't go beyond what you say publicly, but it, it's really important for the audience to know that he did a massive uh, investigation of the intelligence services here, and that's not easy to do in Israel because uh, they're prima donnas in a way, the military and the uh, and the others. And uh, Yuval was very stern, and uh, I hear a lot of comments from a lot of people that uh, you have changed the ability of that committee to function well. I don't heard I heard it only from you, not only from you, but from a lot of people. So I we have to commend you for that. On the other hand, uh, you're in a very sensitive area, and you got to be very careful. So, what did you conclude that that's public about that report that you got? That that your services were a little bit defective, or what? What, what was the conclusion? Well, the, the conclusions were first. Uh, 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 quite similar, in a sense, to the conclusions uh, uh, by similar investigations committees in the United States and in Britain. First, that we have to strengthen the human, the human intelligence, that you cannot trust only uh, technology, even uh, even if you have the state-of-the-art technology, uh, SIGINT or satellites, and, and so on and so forth. This is this is not sufficient. You have to create, and this is not easy, a human uh, intelligence, a, a qualitative human intelligence, in addition. We had some other conclusions about the need for the political echelon, and speci especially the prime minister, to have tools not just to uh, listen and uh, to learn uh, from the intelligence services, but also to oversight them and to direct them and to, uh, uh, in a sense, even to challenge them, to criticize them, to direct them to the most important missions from national security point of view and not just from the IDF point of view or from their own point of view. This is important. We recommended a special uh, intelligence advisor or secretary uh, that will help the prime minister, that will be uh, in the prime minister office, uh, and some uh, structural changes, including shifting some authorities and also some resources from the military intelligence into the Mossad uh, in order to be able to detect uh, nuclear uh, proliferations and nuclear efforts around the globe. Uh, they were also in the public report. Now I'm only quoting the public well, report. Well, if you want to give us the private report, we'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> no. But uh, also some recommendations about priorities, and uh, we emphasized that nuclear threats and uh, a, a nuclear, uh, secret nuclear attempts or industries or, uh, uh, or connections in the Arab world should be first priority and uh, we should invest more on this and maybe less on other issues even like terrorism or like uh, conventional uh, regular uh, uh, intelligence. Uh, for us it was even more overwhelming or, or surprising and devastating uh, the failure in Libya because we knew that something is going on in Libya, but we didn't know the right scales of Libya nuclear program until it was discovered by uh, the CIA and the British uh, MI6. 
And this was main part of our investigation, because uh, this should not happen uh, again and not at first place. So basically, you came to the same conclusion that the American Congress did, that uh, you know, the American Congress now wants to make a cabinet officer in charge and melt or meld all the intelligence services mm -hmm. because there's conflict, uh, there's uh, territorial conflict. Did you see the same thing in between the military and well, Assad? And fir first, uh, 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 no, no, uh, we didn't uh, say that they have to be really melted but that the political echelon have a need to have the tools, uh, mainly the prime minister, to direct the different services to their missions according to his priority, to his priorities. Uh, this is important. He can't do that today? He can do that today, but he, uh, maybe he lacked the tools to oversight, to decide the priorities, to decide about building of the intelligence forces. And uh, therefore we recommended that there will be a, a special secretary for the Prime Minister on intelligence and even a uh, confidential and uh, 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 um, uh, ministerial uh, committee that will oversight the intelligence services like we do in the Knesset in the parliament. You well, if the Menachem Begin, when he made the strike, was that totally his decision? That is totally the prime minister's decision if he wants to, to take out a nuclear plant or does he have to go to a Knesset committee get approval? No, it was totally uh, for him to decide. It's his decision. Yes, but I think he consulted. Well, I'm sure he consulted. With, uh, not, not, not just with, uh, with uh, the opposition with the professionals, too. but with two people, with the chairman or with the head of the opposition, then Shimon, Shimon Peres, Peres. And I think also with the Peres chairman. He was against it, by the way. Yes, and also I think with the chairman of the Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee. Which would be you. In today's business. In today's uh, business, yes. Heavy, heavy responsibility. Well, uh, it is a heavier responsibility to decide, not to be consulted with. <laughs> <laughs> no, but <coughs> it's, a, it's a very interesting that the prime minister alone can make that decision. Mm -hmm. And a prime minister could start a nuclear war. I mean, it's a, you know, it's a reality. I mean, you see novels about this, but it's true. But the same with the President of the United States. I'm not sure. I, I, I'm not sure about the President of the United States whether he has to go to the Senate, uh, one of the committees. I think you're, he may just have to inform them. But he can't start a war without the approval of Congress. On the other hand, so there's an indirect play here. It's really interesting. No, look. Also here, if you want, for example, to start a war, and you need to. Uh, draft the reserves, the, the reserve soldiers in right. Israel, you need the approval of the committee. Of the Knesset, committee. Yes. I think after one or two days you have to have the approval uh -huh. of the committee. That's very interesting. I didn't know that. But usually in our case, <laughs> our adversaries, uh, adversaries. Uh, adversaries <laughs> starts war with us and not vice versa. So there is no question of, of, of uh, in our last interviews, Yuval, you were not very happy with Egypt. Do you still, are you still the same position, or are you a little bit uh, more encouraged by the way they're moving, especially maybe in Gaza? Well, I'm not encouraged at all. Uh, uh, maybe I can be slightly encouraged by their declarations or, or, or rhetoric willingness uh, to help uh, the Palestinians to prevent terrorism. But still, it is more important to see what they're doing on the ground. And on the ground, uh, if to be, uh, uh, if to be uh, very modest, uh, we can say that they are not doing enough to prevent terrorism and to prevent arms smuggling from their territory to our territory or to the Gaza Strip. And if to be bold and clear, we can say that if you don't do everything in your capacity to prevent the smuggling of arms and bombs and explosives for terrorists, and you enable terrorists like the Hamas or other terrorist organizations to transform your land, Sinai, to their logistical 
base, actually, you support terrorism. I must tell you, Leon, honestly, there is no much difference about this between Syria and Egypt. Syria helps the Hezbollah uh, or enables the Hezbollah to get weapons uh, uh, in Lebanon, through Lebanon or through Syria. Egypt helps the Hamas to get weapons and explosives from Egypt. The only difference is that the Syrians are explicit about it. They are doing it explicitly and they are proud about their support for terrorist organization and the Egyptians are a, a tacit about it and uh, the, 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 yes, they, they are saying we are against terrorism, but what can we do? But on the ground there is no much different. Both countries support terrorism against us and I hope that United States can pressure Egypt to stop uh, their support for terrorism, to block Sinai, uh, and to prevent the smuggling of so, uh, so many guns and, and arms and explosives for terrorists. This is extremely important. You succeeded with the Saudis, it's partial, but important success to pressure them not to allow so much money to uh, terrorist organizations. Uh, you have support for that? What? You have support? You've seen... Yes, yes, yes. There are some restrictions now in Saudi Arabia mm -hmm. that make it more difficult. Because there's a movie out called Fahrenheit 9-11, and Bush is criticized by being too pro-Saudi Arabian, but uh, many think that that's really a propaganda film, and it has... Uh, no, I can tell you that in the last two years, the United States put a lot of pressure on Saudi Arabia to prevent money for terrorists, and there is partial, but still significant success. I do hope that uh, exactly like you did with your friends, your allies in Saudi Arabia, you will do with your friends in Egypt. Egypt is receiving more than $2 billion annually. I think more. From the United States, I said more than $2 billion. And you can at least request that Egypt will seize it's support for terrorism, because if you enable terrorists to use your land to transform uh, arms and explosives, this is vital support for terrorism. And if in your media, including your uh, government controlled media, uh, the media do legitimize terrorism, even if it is mainly against Israel and against Jews and not so much against the West anymore, this is an important support, and the United States can stop it by pressuring Egypt. Number one, your prime minister talks to Mubarak, and he does not talk to Assad. And number two, your uh, chief of intelligence meets with the chief of intelligence in Tel Aviv of the Egyptians. So the one thing we know is that at least you have a line of communication. This is important. Very important. But it's not sufficient. All right, we got to cut for a break, Yuval. We'll come right back, and we'll talk to you about a happy subject called Iran and their nuclearization program, which could be very, very dangerous to the state of Israel. We'll be back. In modern Middle East history, only one peace treaty has stood the test of time, the 1978 Camp David Accord. In the new documentary film, Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace, learn the true story behind the greatest diplomatic achievement of our time and its lessons for the future. The price of peace is very high to have this courageous man and my close friend killed. Winner of the Telly Award for Best Cultural Program. Now available at select stores including Barnes & Noble and online at Amazon.com. Get the book that inspired the award-winning movie. Leon Charney's Backdoor Channels is now available in bookstores and online in paperback and an e-book for both Kindle and Nook. It's a great way to learn how history was made behind the scenes. Get it at Amazon.com or Barnes & Noble. Be a witness to history. Order Backdoor Channels online at Amazon.com or buy it at Barnes & Noble and get the real story behind the making of the 1978 Camp David Accords. Anywhere else, this would just be a museum. But this is Jerusalem, and these are the Dead Sea Scrolls, the oldest known biblical text and greatest archaeological find of modern times. And now, they're in New York, 
See the Dead Sea Scrolls Life and Faith in Biblical Times at Discovery Times Square on 44th Street. The wonders of Israel live in all of us. Come find the Israel in you. We're back. I'm Leon Charney. We're in Tel Aviv, Israel. We're interviewing Yuval Steinitz, who is the chairman of the uh, Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee, with the preeminent and most important committee, obviously, in the country, because this country is concerned always with uh, foreign affairs and defense. One of the problems uh, irking, and it's a bad word, irking, one of the problems uh, festering around this area and the world is the fact that Iran is starting to use its muscles and talk a lot about the fact that they have nuclear energy or preparing to have nuclear arms, etc. And everybody who reads the newspaper knows about it. The question is, and they're making virulent statements against the state of Israel. The question is if they're playing chess with Israel in a way to get their population revved up against the Western world, or if they really are saying they're going to talk about destroying Israel, but what they're really doing is threatening the Western civilization. And I think uh, no one is better informed to talk to us about that than Yuval. Uh, Yuval, you know, you hear the threats every day about Iran against Israel. They want to wipe you out. Um, and they're close to developing some nuclear weapons. Your theory is that the West should take care of these guys because those weapons can hit London and Paris and, uh, and all the Western countries. And obviously, the United States should be concerned because we care about nonproliferation. So, should Israel take this whole business about Iran very seriously? I think everybody should take it extremely seriously. Uh, for, I agree, but for, for a variety of reasons. First, uh, one should understand that the Iranian nuclear program is extremely ambitious, much more ambitious than North Korea or Pakistan. If, if uh, they will produce the first nuclear bomb, and then they will be out of the NPT, the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Uh, according to American sources, uh, they will be able to produce approximately 20 bombs annually, which means that Iran is, uh, uh, Iran's goal is to become not a regional nuclear power, not so just to build few few bombs to keep in the shelters or to deter its, uh, to threat uh, its vicinity, but to become a global uh, a nuclear superpower with hundreds of bombs and with very long range missiles. They already got us in, uh, under the range and now they develop and they invest a lot of money. Let me ask you a silly question. Missiles to the ranges of, of, of uh, Berlin and London. Right. Why, yeah. why would they want to do that? Well, I, look, I think... Uh, uh, it's, I, it sounds silly, but the investment is enormous. They have yes. a lot of problems economically. There are a lot of poor people who live in Iran. It has to be either a strategic aim or it has to be a religious aim. So, do you know? I mean, it sounds strategic simplistic. Strategic and religious. I think there are three reasons. It sounds simplistic, but I think you but and I can discuss it, I think, you know? I think uh, there are mainly three reasons. First, they want to, uh, 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 to they, they do compete for leadership in the Muslim and, and even in the Arab world, although Iran is not an Arab country, but they are right. Middle East oriented. And if they will become nuclear, clearly they will be able to, uh, uh, to become leaders of the Middle East, of, of Arab and Muslim uh, countries and to export the Iranian revolution under the nuclear umbrella to countries, to other countries, to force them to accept, like, like Saudi Arabia, like Qatar, like Kuwait, like Iraq, like Syria, even Egypt. Uh, secondly, they do hate the West. And they do hate Israel because Israel is the clearest manifestation of, uh, uh, of the West, of the Western civilization, of the democratic world uh, in the Middle East. And they do hate Israel because Israel considered to be part of the Western world. But they do hate the Western civilization. They do think that there should be only Islamic civilization and that the Western civilization, and especially the United States, or the most of the United States, is a threat 
to Islam, a threat to uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran. And, I, I, and, and just let me uh, 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 um, uh, finish with the third argument. The third argument is uh, the preservation of the regime. Uh, it is clear that dictatorship or such a totalitarian regime with nuclear capacities will be more stable regime than without it. It's helped for the stabilization of such totalitarian regime against internal uh, um, uh, enemies and also against external enemies. All right. But we have interviewed a lot of people who've been to Iran. And Elaine Cellino, who is a New York Times reporter, wrote a book called The Hundred Faces of Persia. We interviewed a fellow for Forbes magazine who came back and said that he expects a revolution in Iran because the youth in Iran defy these uh, ayatollahs. There is an underground life, totally westernized. Uh, you have parties, discos, internet. The whole system in the youth is totally different than what the ayatollahs are doing today. So there is a feeling by these people that there could be an interior re revolution by the youth. And you know, there are more youth there than there are old people. Uh, you don't get that, huh? You're not hearing that at all. No, I, I am not optimistic. Uh, 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 many people develop hopes about the reformist, uh, reformist revolution in Iran until uh, a year and a half ago, but nothing. Now, Almost the Ayatollahs control. Khatami is the president. Yes. He's elected. He has certain powers, but the Ayatollahs let, control. Let's put it like this. If Iran will become nuclear, it will be more difficult and more unlikely that such a reform or, or even a revolt or an uprise will take place. Uh, but uh, th therefore, and, and for other reasons, and, and for the reasons that you cannot predict what those uh, ayatollahs will do with nuclear capacity. Uh, you cannot, uh, um, uh, uh, you cannot uh, build on mutual deterrence between, for example, the United States or NATO and the ayatollahs. Uh, they already said that they can suffer several million casualties without difficulty, unlike the West and unlike Israel. So I would say that it's better for the Middle East, for Israel, for United States, and even for Iranians, that uh, Iran will be prevented, and that this problem will be seriously addressed by uh, the Western world and mainly by the United States of America. The New York, uh, no, the International Herald Tribune had a, an article here two days ago which inferred that Arak Sharon might do a preventative hit against the nuclear possibility or nuclearization of Iran. Uh, and that's a very worrisome thing to him. This was a history professor at uh, Hebrew University. Yeah. I don't remember his name, but this obviously appeared all over the world. Yeah. Do you think that Israel would ever, in a sense, uh, that would be a very, very difficult thing to do because wouldn't that absolutely put a war here? I mean, do you think? I don't know, but in any case, I think that it's not uh, up to us to solve this problem. Uh, unlike Iraq in the 80s, this is a global problem. This is a global threat. The Iranians are building missiles and they invest a lot of money in it. Uh, with the ranges of Europe, they already got us in the range of their missiles. Now they are building missiles with ranges of four and six thousand kilometers. And I think that it's up to the, the to NATO and to the United but States to solve this problem and not for a mini school Israel. I understand, but suppose they don't want to solve it. Oh, uh, your duty is to protect your people. This is true, but the president of the United States made it extremely clear that the United States will not allow Iran to become nuclear. And uh, just last month, uh, Condoleezza Rice and, uh, um, and uh, Rumsfeld said the same. So it's up 
I would say, to the free will to solve this you problem like, under the leadership the, of the United States. And it is better that nobody in the Western world or in the United States uh, will think that little Israel uh, will solve uh, its global problem with Iran. I don't want to get uh, into an argument with you, but I could raise different arguments for you. Uh, we had Ruby Ribbon on last mm. week, and he said it's the duty of Israel to defend its people, period. And he can't defend, or I mean depend and defend, or depend on anybody else except. So you oh, can oh, give oh. me a classical answer, which is a, a well-informed answer, that it is a Western problem and that it's a world problem, and, and it, it makes sense that it's true. That assumes that the leadership wants to move that. You have a duty. You're chairman of the defense and, and finance, uh, defense and foreign affairs for this country. And not only you, but the prime minister has a duty to protect its citizens. And I'm not trying to get you into a nuclear or the run. But I hear a lot of buzz about this. I hear a lot of buzz about uh, Israel. I met a, a former member of the Mossad who, who had dinner with me. He nearly swallowed the fish because he's so nervous about the fact that he thinks that Israel would make a nuclear strike. I can't ask you on television if that's a possibility because it's a silly question to ask you. But I do think that you would agree with me that the duty of the Israeli government is to protect its citizenship and not only depend on Condoleezza Rice's words or, or uh, Mr. Rumsfeld. I mean, they can change their words. And as we see in America, George Bush got into huge trouble, even on a State of the Union address, as to what was uh, WMD, weapons of mass destruction. What I think I'm saying to you is that uh, I think the world does look to Israel, at least for good eyes and ears, to, to know what's going on. And uh, I think that you would agree that from that, pro from, from that point of view, you would share anything that you knew at the Western world. I mean, obviously, in intelligence, etc. But at the end of the day, it's, 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 it's an interesting and vital question. Uh, I don't know the answer. And let, let, me, let me put it this, although this is slightly complicated. It's rhetorical, formula. too. It's, of course, we have to do everything to protect our people and to prevent, uh, 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 and to prevent such a devastating threat. But in this case, it is a threat to the entire world, especially to the Western world and to the United States. And uh, it's not up to little Israel to solve this uh, problem alone or even to lead the world. There is a very clear leadership to the democratic uh, world, and this is the United States of America. And like in the Second World War, it is again up to the United States of America uh, to lead the democratic world and to solve this problem. And this should be clear because it will be dangerous if people in Europe or in the United States will say, ah, it's up to little Israel to solve our problem with Iran. This is not the case. Uh, what, uh, Are you people worried about North Korea also? Or you know? Not that, of course. Uh, no, not uh, that. By the way, North Korea is a threat, but not such a devastating threat even to the world because it's nuclear uh, program. It's you know, it's interesting. Developed. If you read the books about Menachem Begin, when he made the decision, the United States was against it. Yes. Are you aware of that? Yes, of course. <laughs> and <laughs> so today, I think that uh, it is clear that we were right. And oh, that's obvious. That we saved the, the world and the region and the world from a devastating threat. Uh, with a nuclear bomb, uh, Kuwait would be part of Iraq until today, and maybe even uh, Saudi Arabia. Saddam Hussein would control your oil and uh, the entire region and maybe you would use it and millions of people would die in, uh, in nuclear war uh, between Iraq and maybe not just Israel, but its neighbors. Do you consider Iran the greatest threat right now to the world? Yes, Iran is, uh, because the Iranian nuclear program are extremely ambitious, as I said before, the scale of the program of the nuclear industry is such, and also of the missile uh, uh, development are such, 
that if Iran will become nuclear, it will become a global superpower, not like Pakistan or North Korea, but more similar uh, uh, to, to China or, or to Britain. Or maybe not to the United States, but at least to China or Britain. All right, let me change the subject for one minute. Iraq becomes a democracy. Does Israel expect that you would have an embassy there and you could trade with them? Because there have been some tough comments out of them that they really weren't going to uh, dealing with Israel, although they don't even have a democratic regime right now. What are you hearing? No, I think that, uh, of course, for us, uh, it will be important to have uh, diplomatic relations and peace with Iraq. Uh, but I don't see it forthcoming. Iraq is too weak now and too dependent uh, on the Arab world, and the government is too dependent uh, 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 maybe to conduct such a move, which is a difficult move in the Arab world because of terrible incitement. By the way, even the incitement in countries that did peace with us, like Egypt, for example. Strange, Egypt made peace with Israel, but the delegitimation of Israel's very existence as a tiny Jewish democracy is... is how about uh, Jordan? The, uh, also in Jordan there is terrible incitement, but uh, at least the government is trying to, to fight it, to prevent it. You're satisfied with the way the king of Jordan behaves with Israel? Uh, well, usually, but not in the last few months. There were some declarations that were very negative. One of them was even odd. Uh, when, the king, the, uh, when the king of Jordan said that the Palestinian are doing or might be doing too much uh, concessions vis-a-vis -vis Israel, which is strange, yes. To tell one side that he shouldn't make concessions for peace, strange. But generally speaking, we have very good relations and cooperation uh, with Jordan, much better than with Egypt. And the Jordanian, by the way, unlike the Egyptians, they are doing serious efforts to prevent terrorists to use their land to smuggle arms and explosives into, the, uh, into Israel or into the Palestinian territories. Uh, unlike the Egyptians, they are serious about it and extremely efficient in the prevention of terrorism. You don't expect to get an invitation by Mubarak uh, to, your country, to his country, do you? Well, let's hope that uh, this uh, negative attitude anti-Israeli attitude, anti-peace attitude uh, will change in the future, and then I'll be glad to travel to Egypt. All right. Let's talk about the Navy. The last time you were on the show, you were hugely uh, inspired by the fact that Israel's Navy should expand, and you had good reasons that the airfields take uh, space and land, and whereas the water, you can do other things. Is that still a program of yours? Yes, of course. I think it is. Uh, a mistake in Israel, a doctrine of defense, that we do not develop a real a navy, not just sea superiority. We, we have sea superiority, but that we don't use the Eastern Mediterranean as our strategic uh, depths. You know, any country, especially country under existential threat, like Israel, needs some strategical depths. And uh, if you don't have strategical depths on ground, on land, because Israel is such a minuscule country, such a little uh, a, a country, you have at least to create some kind of strategical depths at sea. And I think that it is necessary for us uh, to uh, create a new method of sea power that will enable to use our sea superiority that already exists in the Eastern Mediterranean in order to uh, create massive firepower, conventional, but very accurate, very massive firepower from sea deep into land, uh, and in order to compensate uh, for the lack of any uh, strategical depths on land. If you know, has Israel been assisting the United States government in Iraq in any way, in any capacity? Well, I'm unable to elaborate about this, but uh, I can only repeat about what was published, that uh, there was very good cooperation uh, between the uh, intelligence services of both countries, actually of some other countries in the Western world, but including Israel, United States, Britain, 
and other uh, countries. And uh, of course, Israel and the United States are uh, close allies and we help each other. But I'm unable to elaborate about what we do and how uh, we happen to help the United States in, in, in many places and many cases. Uh, I am more free to tell how the United States helped Israel at past and present, and uh, this is very important. We are grateful for, for, for this friendship and assistance. All right, we got to cut to a break, and we'll conclude with uh, Yuval asking a couple of more easy questions. I've been uh, really hitting him hard with some <laughs> tough questions here, but uh, he can take it. And the American audience uh, should you know, get some information here that they really can't find any other place. That's our goal. We'll be right back. So you need title insurance. Well, the Monty Group provides the last word on service and the first word on reliability. We're known for our integrity and experience. With over 100 years of collective experience in title insurance, the Monty Group and affiliates serve clientele nationwide from the smallest residential closing to the largest retail mall in America. The Monty Group serves each client like family. Our highly experienced and professional title insurance staff includes many with business and governmental expertise invaluable assets in a real estate driven economy we know that satisfying and sound service counts the list of multi-million dollar transactions insured by the monty group are too numerous to mention call us we'll be glad to tell you about them i'm vincent monty and you can count on me What do you say? <laughs> well, we are building our security fence, uh, which is important. You agree with it? I, I agree with the basic concept that sooner or later we have to separate ourselves from the Palestinians. Is that for demographics also? On? Yes, yes, that's exactly. The fence is important not just for the prevention of terrorism. It is a useful tool, an efficient tool, but, but uh, terrorists can can bypass the fence by through a few methods. But it's also important to prevent a, 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 a demographic immigration of Palestinians and into Israel proper, uh, to prevent crimes in the border zone. And uh, the Palestinian Authority encouraged Palestinians to save cars, cattle, uh, tractors in the uh, border zone. And it's really helped, uh, to, especially farmers uh, along the border, on, uh, in the Israeli side, on the Israeli side of the border, to conduct normal life. So it was built in order to prevent terrorism, suicide bombers, actually, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to travel, to, to walk into Israel. But it is very efficient uh, also to prevent uh, to defend the demographic balance within Israel and to defend the normal life within in Israel. Okay, so when I say International Court of the Hague, what do you say? Oh, I think that this was uh, a shame to the international community. I'll tell you, I met with Solana, the first coming the elected the European foreign minister. And he was apologizing that they had to vote in the United Nations with the Arab uh, block because they were against bringing this case to the court in Hague, but still, but they uh, although they disagree, they have to respect the results because they do support uh, institutes of the international community, and they do like to see judicial, uh, a global judicial system. But uh, look, uh, but you, those, those are your standards of judicial system that a country uh, will be brought to the court by simply voting. Uh, it's clear that if there would be 55 Jewish states and only one Muslim or Arab state, it, would, it could be vice versa. So the Palestinians or the Egyptians would 
uh, uh, would be uh, charged. And, and I saw he was extremely embarrassed because clearly this is not a judicial system, this is not an independent judicial system, but a system that can, uh, uh, by that, the UN. that will bring the uh, Israelis into court because the uh, Arabs and Muslims have more hands in the United Nations than, than Jews, than the Jewish state. This is, this is, uh, this is not desirable. This is a shame to the international community, and this is a shame to the uh, international, uh, to the Hague uh, um, uh, court. One of your members of Knesset, his uh, name is Vilan from Peace Now, which you used to belong to. Many years ago. Yes, gave, yes, gave a, an interview in Aretz, which is a prime newspaper here, stating that he expects that within the next six to eight months there could be a civil war here between the uh, orthodox and non-orthodox, or the right wing and the left wing. Give me your take on that. I think that he is completely wrong about it. There is no possibility for civil war in Israel. The basic elementary necessary conditions for civil war doesn't exist. True that we have uh, people on the right and people on the left, like in any country, like in the United States. But the, popu the population in Israel is so mixed with each other. In my family, there are people that are on the extreme left and on the moderate left, or on the moderate right, like myself, and also uh, 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 on the extreme right. We will not fight with each other. We can argue, we can debate, we can demonstrate, like in any other country, there will be no civil war. There might be numerous incidents of violence uh, by some uh, uh, Michigan, by some crazy people, uh, but not more than that. So I think that <laughs> this is impossible in the Israeli conditions but to uh, have such a you, development. Did, did you think that a Jew would kill uh, Yitzhak Rabin, a, a prime minister? No, it's, uh, well, of course, I'm extremely, everybody is extremely sad that this happened, but this uh, could happen in any other case. In the United States, it's happened that an American killed or was trying to kill the American president. In Sweden, it's happened, and in, in many other countries. And it's unfortunately happened also in Israel with the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin. But this is far, far from civil war. The fact that you have one a, 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 a ideological murderer doesn't mean that you have the basic conditions for people, for groups in the population to fight with each other. Nobody desire it and there are no minimal conditions for it because the Israeli society, more than other societies, is so the mixture between different fragments in society, between left and right, between religious and seculars between settlers and people who are living in Israel proper. The mixture is such that it's impossible. Well, now I'll ask you the easy question, you Yuval. Do you, finally, think, do you think that we could, as it exists today, will exist in three years the yes, same way? Yes. You don't think this factionalization that's going on, fellows like Feiglin, who was a very right-wing guy, and uh, Uzi Landau versus uh, Bibi Netanyahu, who just visited you here, and uh, Arik Sharon, uh, do you think they'll bridge this gap? I mean, you're in the middle of a tumultuous period. I now that we took care of the world, let's look a bit just into the Likud. Yes, I, unlike your friend and my friend, Ruby Rivlin, I think uh, we are not going to uh, be split. Uh, I think that we shall overcome the current differences even quite easily. Easily? Yes, even, uh, well, even announce quite announce it on this show, I think you'll become a prophet. How easily? Well, I think that uh, in a year from now, uh, you shall not hear about it anymore. Yes. You should hear about other internal debates in the Likud, but we are a very vivid uh, 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 party democracy. Do you think Sharon was slapped by this vote last week, which told him you know, A, you can't bring in a Labor Party, and B, that uh, you don't have a vote of confidence for us on withdrawal. Was that a slap in the face? Uh, yes and no. I mean, it was, in a sense. But he could 
uh, he, he will be able to change it. Really? If Sharon will come in a few months' time with a reasonable uh, agreement draft with the Labour Party, and people in the Likud will feel that they can live with it, and uh, members of Knesset and ministers in the Likud will be able to live with it, it will pass. The fact that it didn't pass is not due to the uh, to the fears of people or opposition of people to the unilateral disengagement, but mainly because people were afraid from the unknown. And nobody know what the agreement with the Labour Party is going to look like. People were afraid to lose their jobs, to lose their jobs of their friends and ministers and, and others. People were afraid that uh, the agreement might change our uh, uh, political uh, and out, economic we're direction. Out of time, and this was but that's a very uh, hopeful finish that the Likud will accept the Labour Party as long as there's an agreement that everybody wants to accept. Uh, that's that everybody way. can accept. Yuval, we're out of time. I'm sad because it's always fascinating to talk with you. Arik Sherman will get a copy of this tape, so will George Bush. I think this may have an effect on both their lives. If you are correct, then let's hope so. It means that the, the Likud will stay in power the way it is today. There is a possibility that the Labor government could join if the proposal is correct. And there are some questions about weapons of mass destruction, who knew what, which is uh, a big story in the world today. Thank you, Leon. As always. My pleasure. Keep going. Thanks. We'll see you next week. In modern Middle East history, only one peace treaty has stood the test of time, the 1978 Camp David Accord. In the new documentary film, Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace, learn the true story behind the greatest diplomatic achievement of our time and its lessons for the future. The price of peace is very high to have this courageous man and my close friend killed. Winner of the Telly Award for Best Cultural Program. Now available at select stores including Barnes & Noble and online at Amazon.com. Get the book that inspired the award-winning movie. Leon Charney's Backdoor Channels is now available in bookstores and online in paperback and an e-book for both Kindle and Nook. It's a great way to learn how history was made behind the scenes. Get it at Amazon.com or Barnes & Noble. Be a witness to history. Order Backdoor Channels online at Amazon.com or buy it at Barnes & Noble and get the real story behind the making of the 1978 Camp David Accords. Anywhere else, this would be a vacation on the Mediterranean. But here, it's also a journey into history. From modern Tel Aviv to the ancient cities of Herod, the Romans, the Crusaders. The history of Israel lives in all of us. Come find the Israel in you.